evening for LINFA and uh, thank you for attending this uh, seminar. So just, I mean, this is obviously a seminar in the context of the um, USF Initiative Institute uh, on Microbiome and uh, thank you very much also to Mingji for organizing this uh, series of seminars and it's a great pleasure, really a great pleasure to have LINFA Wang with us. LINFA has a very interesting track. Uh, he has been trained in China, then uh, in the US uh, at the University of California, Davis. And then he moved to Australia, and this is a, some, a point he will really illustrate during his talk. He really has a huge experience regarding animal health. And in fact, he has been working uh, for many years, and he is a senior scientist at the CSIRO, Australian Animal Health Laboratory in Geelong. He is now director and professor uh, at the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School in Singapore, director of the program in emerging infectious disease. As you can see from the title, LINFA is really an expert on the impact of bats on viruses, and uh, he has been uh, he has been playing and he is playing a major role on uh, COVID-19. He's an expert for many committees, but in particular for WHO, involved in the uh, ongoing search for the origin of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, also LINFA is a director of the Global Virus Network Center in Singapore and a very active member of the Global Virus Network. And we are very grateful to him uh, for this. So LINFA, Again, thank you for being with us, and it will be a great pleasure to listen to your talk. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, everybody, uh, uh, Ming and uh, others, for inviting and organizing this. And I apologize for some reason, you know, it took 10 minutes to figure out to share the slides, but I still could not see you. So I have to give you just a, you know, faceless <laughs> talk today. Yes, it's a great pleasure. As Christian said, you know, I have spent my 30 years of my career really focused on bats and the viruses. When I started, uh, it's not that popular and nobody believed bats are important. But nowadays, you know, you cannot go to a major emerging infectious disease uh, 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 conference without a bat talk, you know. So my title today is a bats and the virus. Really try to ask the question why bats are so special as a natural reservoir for viruses. Is that a success story of co-evolution, you know? So I hope I can cover that. So here is the outline. You know, when you talk about bats and viruses, you know, I'd like to give you a quick review. Although I think that the flavor of the year, maybe flavor of 2021 as well is COVID-19, but I will show you that, you know, we have had uh, at least 20 to 30 years of experience of uh, zoonotic virus of confirmed or suspected bat origin. And COVID-19 is predicted, you know, by people like me and others working in the field. But I guess we could not predict the scale and the speed of spread. As Christian said, virus origin and virus hunter is my kind of speciality. And it's obvious very important to know the origin, you know, uh, because that will help to understand the early transmission event, and hopefully we can prevent or at least mitigate future pandemics. And then I think the core part of the talk is why bats, right? Are bats special? Why are they special? Last is my kind of pet project. In the COVID-19, I feel personally that, you know, I have been really focusing on serology, and we made some contributions that I'd like to share with you, both in the context of now vaccine, monitoring and also in terms of the virus origin uh, investigation. So this is kind of my personal story from Hanjiu to Wuhan in a quarter of century. You know, Wuhan now everybody knows where it is, you know, middle center China. Hanjiu, I think maybe none of you knew in the audience, maybe with exceptional Christian. So Hanjiu is a suburb of Brisbane in Australia where the first major that zoonotic virus outbreak started. Uh, it was in 1994 and initially was called the equine mobility virus because it, it started from horses and transmitted to human. 
with the case, case fatality in horses is 70%, in humans 50%. So it's much more lethal than COVID-19 or SARS. So my involvement was to really capitalize the, the genome of the virus and the rename the virus as a Hendra virus. So that was really, I think, the first lethal virus in modern history jumped out of bats and caused a small outbreak, but highly lethal outbreak. Importantly, as you can see that, you know, it's not a bat to human jump, it's a bat through an intermediate host, it's called uh, horses. Five years later, we have a nipple outbreak in Malaysia and Singapore and use the pig as the intermediate host. And then of course, SARS in 2002, 2003, and the civis is the intermediate host. MERS in 2012, camel, Ebola, we think is direct back to human transmission and started in uh, uh, Guinea. And now COVID-19, I think, you know, most likely the ancestor virus is from bats, but we don't know if there's a, a animal X, we call it an intermediate animal is involved. So I'll come back later. So ever since the discovery of, you know, we I have been working this for a long, long time and there are many scientists now involved uh, globally we discover a vast genetic diversity and a worldwide distribution of what we now call is a SARS red coronavirus or SARS RCOVs. So in bats, and also we had a serology evidence to say that it's not only SARS and MERS, basically human have been exposed to SARS related coronavirus, at least in Southern China, because that's the most intensive surveillance was done. And, uh, but now you see in the media, you know, like in Italy and in Spain, you know, maybe we had uh, other SARS RCOVs, you know, have spread over to human without cause major disease outbreak so that, you know, we don't know, but serologically there are some evidence start to emerge. So we have been predicting more outbreaks by this class of viruses. And this is a very old bat coronavirus family tree. We did that more than 10 years ago. And so in those days, you know, we see this is the human SARS coronavirus. And then when you search hard enough, you find many, many bat coronaviruses. But our attention was really focused on this branch, a branch because that's, a, 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 we think, uh, the use of human ac 2 and has more chance to jump. So SARS is here on this family tree. And when WHO or, you know, Chinese government asks us where SARS come back, and my standard answer is yes, but we don't know where and when. Where in two contexts. One is on this family tree, we don't know where the virus will be jumped. We were thinking it's going to be here. And the other is geographic location. Is it going to be only in Southern China? Is it going to be a Southeast Asia, right? So 2012, when the MERS coronavirus jumped, we were caught really, really by surprise because we were beaten in terms of our prediction, you know, in terms of the where. We thought you'll be here, and we thought we'll be in Asia. So it's on a different branch of the tree, and it's in Middle East. So after that, basically, I say, you know, if MERS can jump and the SARS can jump in two different continents and can kill human, then I think it's almost certain that there will be another back coronavirus, you know, jump somewhere in the world and from anywhere on this tree. Okay, so after the MERS coronavirus, you know, this is the time I moved from Australia to Singapore and the Straits Times, you know, uh, made an interview with me and the journalists were very, very pushing, asked me to predict, you know, I'm a conservative scientist, usually I don't predict, but because the area I'm working in is that I'm so certain, you know, there will be another outbreak. So I said, you know, I can back on this that, you know, in the next 10 years, so that's in 2013, I said there will be another new killer virus spread by bats and will emerge. Okay, as a scientist, you know, you guys, you know, especially you, the junior, junior scientist in the audience, I think, uh, you know, in your career, if you can predict a major event correctly, you should be celebrating. But unfortunately, in our uh, profession, if we got your prediction right, means people have to die, right? So this is a pretty sad prediction. Also, it's a huge pandemic. So people can argue that's a fluke, you know, I mean, you know, you say this to a newspaper, but I can prove that's not, you know, 2016. I had a grant, name is come back to the next SARS and MERS like emerging infectious disease outbreak by improving active surveillance. And just three months before the COVID-19, December 2019, you know, we published a paper, you know, it, it went online around the September uh, uh, last year. 
basically we put a review on the virus investment potential spill to animals and humans. And as you can see, among the known unknowns, I said that coronavirus may be more likely cause of future spillover into humans. Okay. So you have seen the timeline and people, you know, highlight different timelines, different ways. But one thing is clear, right? Until December 31st, the world did not know. Something is happening in Wuhan. There's a severe pneumonia of unknown etiology, just like SARS, you know, a typical pneumonia 17 years ago. It's always winter in China. And then I'm not going to really, uh, you know, elaborate these events, you know, go from 31st December to the 30th of January. The World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern. And as uh, Christian already mentioned, I sit on many WHO commission uh, uh, committees, and I was one of the 16 international experts on this committee, which declared fake. Uh, it's a very, very intense, you know, uh, uh, exercise. But I like to highlight two important dates on this time scale. One is January 11th. So this was the first whole genome sequence of this now we call uh, SARS-CoV-2. In those days, it's called novel coronavirus 2019. You know, I mean, obviously, for anybody who works in uh, emerging infectious disease nowadays, I think the most important has to be the genome. Because the genome tells you exactly which one is the virus, and we know that it's a very SARS life. But more importantly, because the genome now really guides all the subsequent responses. First of all, accurate diagnosis, and then therapeutics, then you know, trace for the origin, then molecular epidemiology, vaccine development, you know, escape from mutant, pathogenesis, on and on, right? So today, just this morning, Nature basically listed 10 people who helped to shape science in 2020. Obviously, you know, scientists involved in this has to be listed. And sure enough, Dr. Zhang Yunzhen from China, with the help of Eddie Holmes from Australia, they released the first genome sequence on January 11th. And the nature journalist basically, I think, you know, interviewed me before that, asked me to rank what's the number one. I said this is number one. So I'm very pleased. He cited my post, says, you know, that was the most important day in the COVID-19 outbreak, and says Lin Fa Wang. The second important really date in the early sort of pandemic to me is January 20th. This is the date that the, that the Chinese authority or the experts in China hold a press conference in Beijing and Professor Zhong Nan said basically declare in public to say there is evidence of human to human transmission. Before that, the diplomatic language is there's no solid evidence of significant human to human transmission. So that's January 20th, and everybody knows, right? Three days later, the government of Wuhan basically shut the whole city down, you know, 11 million. You know, in those days, we were not used to it. And I mean, we even, you know, heard in the media think this is a violation of human rights. But look at the world now, you know, there are so many lockdowns, shutdowns, you know, Singapore included. And uh, the impact is huge. You know, I was on the ground January 14th to uh, uh, January 18th, I was in Wuhan and I was doing collaboration in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, you know. So that's the institute now is also world famous. Uh, and uh, I just want to show you two photos, right? So January 18th in the morning, I left the Wuhan. So this is a direct flight from Wuhan to Singapore. As you can see, you know, this is three days, you know, basically, sorry, this is five days before the, the city was going to be shut down. 0% mask. You know, this is a winter in China. Usually you have 1% to 3% people just wear masks every winter. But in a very crowded gate to check in the direct flight to Singapore, nobody wear a mask. Why? Because the official sort of uh, status is uh, this new coronavirus has no human to human transmission. And two weeks later, the last direct flight, because the Singapore government basically says, you know, uh, any Singaporean you come back, you know, that's the last direct flight. And you look at that 100%, 100% on masks. So that's why I think it's really important, you know, uh, all this, the genome information, the human to human transmission information. If we had that information earlier, we could have prevent, you know, at least grad, uh, uh, greatly reduce the transmission. So now to the origin and the early transmission events, right? So the 
Uh, we know now the virus is most similar to a bat coronavirus, so I'll come back later. But as I already said in the first you know, introduction, in the last 25 years, we have six major outbreaks caused by bat bones or nautical viruses. And almost all of them need an intermediate host. You know, Hendra is a host and uh, SARS is civet. So SARS-CoV-2 right now, we still think there's animal, but we don't know which ones. We call it animal X. And, you know, there's some really wide speculations of snake could be involved. You know, I personally don't think so. The only sort of uh, 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 rationale is because snake also carry coronavirus, which I don't think is strong enough evidence. A pangolin is also, you know, right now the front runner. I mean, pangolin at least is possible, but we need a more conclusive evidence. I think it has to be a mammal, you know, uh, uh, snake is less likely. There are many papers already published, but I'm going to list, you know, uh, uh, two really sort of uh, important milestone papers. So this is the one from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So Zhou Peng is the first author. He was my first former postdoc trained in Singapore. So remember, I was in uh, Wuhan January 14th to 18th. I was helping them to formulate this paper. So this is the first paper to say that found a virus, you know, in bats, which is 96% identical to the SARS-CoV-2. So that's why now most people think the ancestor virus came from bats. And then many papers followed just a month later, basically uh, revealed that pangolin has SARS-CoV-2 related coronaviruses. Okay, so I just show you this phylogeny, and I don't want to show you too many phylogenies, just this is the one of them. And now with the SARS-related coronavirus, we have two lineages. The blue one is the SARS-1, basically. The, this is the human SARS, and this is the bat SARS-like coronavirus. And here, the pink one is the second lineage. Is the, you know, in the paper called 2019 NCOV, now is SARS-CoV-2. And all these are human viruses, and the red dot is the pangolin virus. So, I mean, it's pretty close. It's the genome the identity is around 90%, and uh, but it's not as close as the bat virus. So this is the arrow points to the bat virus. As you can see, the bat virus, you know, is just next to the human virus. Then you have the pangolin virus. Okay. So in all the papers that to do with pangolin virus, I think, you know, I think there is a major limitation is the serology. They only had one uh, ELISA result demonstrated a one in 80 uh, uh, positive. One in 80 first is not very high. And also, it's only a binding antibody, it's not a neutralizing antibody. So I will come back later to say that, you know, my uh, uh, own experience is that serology has to be the really a frontline screening tool if you want to survey animals. The other thing is interesting for those of you who could not read the Chinese, I apologize. So this, I mean, the, the Huanan seafood the market, the wholesale market in Wuhan, that's where I think the first alarm bear ran, just like the, the a wet market in Shenzhen for SARS, you know. So in one cluster, about, you know, 50 patients, 70%, 75% all had a link, epidermal link back to this market. That's why, you know, immediately China CDC think it's a zoonotic virus, you know. Although now there are evidence of uh, the first case in Wuhan, the human cases, uh, the patient had never had any contact with animal or never went to any of the a lot of animal market. So the, the the real picture is still not clear, but this is interesting because in that live so-called Huanan Sea for the wholesale market, it's a misnomer because they sell lots of mammals, you know. So for those of you who could not read, I said they sold almost everything except pangolin. And the other important animal is the civet cat, you know, civets. So in this market, you can buy civet meat or you can buy live civet, you know. So civets are highly susceptible to Sounds like coronaviruses, okay? Okay, so now I think, you know, unfortunately the origin of virus become a political issue, which I don't like, but I like to, you know, just go back to the really uh, tracing back to the origin for SARS 17 years ago, I was deeply involved, you know? So for SARS, it's the opposite, you know, the, uh, the group led by Iguan and the Malik, you know, they actually find the virus in civets in the market first. Basically, this is an intermediate host, and they found a virus that, uh, which is uh, around, you know, 99.9% .9 identical. So it's basically the virus almost identical to human, and we believe that's the intermediate host. And then 
you know, I was in a WHO mission and then I organized a consortium with five institutes, two from Australia, two from China, one from uh, USA. And within two years, we discovered that SARS-like coronavirus can be found in bats, you know. So, so this is go cool from civets intermediate host and then search for the origin of the virus. But I like, I'll be the first one to admit, you know, we, we got this into a, a, a very high profile publication science. But I think at that time, you know, there are two things. One is that uh, the sequencing, as you can see, the identity of this is only 82 to 92 at the genome level. And the virus, we, we failed to isolate live virus because the spike protein of this bat virus failed to use AC2 as a receptor. It took, you know, uh, Susan Lee's lab in Wuhan another 10 years of uh, longitudinal example in the same cave in Yunnan province. Then we discovered that, you know, a live virus from bat now can use ACE2. So it took more than 10 years. And look at this. The sequence identity genome-wise is still not 99. It's 95% overall sequence identity, all right, and 96 identity in IBD. So I always try to, you know, talk to the journalists. They think that, you know, uh, we are so slow this year. We still have not found the, uh, uh, the, the, the progenitor virus or the virus origin. But I said for SARS, it took us 10 years and we only found the one which is 95% identical. So this is a comparison, you know, search for the virus origin. And I highlight, we, you know, most of the work is done in China only. And I will tell you later why that's not going to be a good idea, okay? So 17 years ago for SARS-CoV, five months, we discovered this intermediate host in civets, which is more than 99% identical to the human virus. It took two years of international consortium, five institutes, three nations, we discovered this virus in bats, which is 88 to 92% identical genome level. 10 years later, we got a bat virus, now is 95% identical genome level. Now you look at the, uh, what we have done, you know, for SARS-CoV-2. Five days, five days after human genome was obtained by the Wuhan State Virology, they discovered a bat virus, which is 96% identical. And then within two months, several groups, you know, three groups found a related virus in pangolins, which is 90% genome identical. But we still don't have a one really very closely related, which is true for also SARS-CoV-1. Okay, so I'll come back to this later for the virus origin when I talk about serology. Now I'm going to really sort of uh, go to the next topic is why bats, right? So, you know, why bats sort of carry all this virus? So I'll just give you a little bit of a bat facts. Obviously, this is not a, a pure bat biology talk. But for those of you who have never, you know, uh, uh, exposed to bats, this is important because the bats are the most long-lived relative lifespan I'm talking about, right? They have the longest lifespan for mammals. And, uh, you know, seven gram bats can live up to 43 years. Most mammals, are uh, their uh, longevity or lifespan is proportional to their body size. You know, we always say one dog year equal to seven human years. So if you do that, a seven gram bat one year is equal to, you know, at least 20 to 30 human years. So that we are talking about a bat which is thousand years old, a human, you know. And they have their low rate of tumorigenesis. You know, bats really don't suffer cancer. And uh, you cannot tell a bat whether it's young bats or old bats unless it's a baby bats or very old bats. So the equivalent of 20 to maybe 80 years old of human for bats, you cannot differentiate. They really have a healthy aging process. And also bats, of course, you know, uh, I was the pioneer, but now they internationally, there's so many people are doing bat bone virus without any debate now bats is an important reservoir of viruses and most of them they can carry them asymptomatically and uh during fly you know even more amazing is their metabolic rate goes to 30 up to 30 for their resting rate heartbeats go to over a thousand beats per minute and body temperature can go all the way to 42 degrees c imagine any of them happens to a human you will die right because for bats that's a few hours a night during fly, and they happens every day. And for that bats, they have to do this for 43 years, you know. So there's something fundamentally different in bat biology, bat immunology, bat metabolism. So about 10 years ago, you know, basically I decided to really switch my resources from bat-borne viruses to bat biology. 
So again, you know, it's a consortium, almost the same group involved in three nations. And we sequenced two bats. One is the flying fox from Australia, one is the mouse bat from China. And we got really, I mean, there are many other discoveries, but two really, really surprising sort of discovery we had is that first of all, is we found that, you know, at the genome level compared with land mammals, the flying mammal has uh, enhanced DNA damage repair. And on the other hand, they have a reduced inflammation. Okay. So what makes a mammal, you know, extremely healthy? And I think uh, without any debate now, bats are the most healthy mammal, you know, about all the mammals we have. I think, you know, what we discover is that really the importance of the innate defense and the tolerance balance. Okay. And uh, so in my last eight years since I moved to Singapore, I've been focusing on bat immunology and bat biology. And we have examples of elevated innate defense in comparison to the human mouse, but more importantly, is dampened in an over response and that has increased tolerance. So I give this animation, I like this, you know, because uh, it's a really kind of uh, tells a very good story how for an animal, human, you know, any living organs to keep healthy is you need to be balanced, right? I mean, that's, we know for sure, you know, you have to be balanced. So we're talking about if you have not enough defense and the cancer cells or infectious agents can grow very rapidly and kill you. But if you have overreaction like autoimmune disease or even for COVID-19, you know, uh, the overinflammation play a role. So no organisms, whether you're bat or human is perfect, right? You know, other, you know, different age, different, you know, uh, uh, diet or stress, you know, for humans, jet lag, you know, lack of sleep, whatever. And uh, so, but the difference is that to get to the balance for humans, you know, we fluctuate with a greater range than the bat. Okay, bats do that as well, but it's a much more controlled. And that's why you can prevent disease by preventing over defense or over tolerance. So this is based on you know, defense genes X, Y, Z, it could be heat shock proteins, interferons, you know, I1 beta, uh, 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 caspase one, you know, you can just name it. So these are real data points. So what we have a mock, and then we have inducer one is poly IC, inducer two is send out virus. This is a human mouse and this is a bat. So as you can see already, human mouse, we're very familiar. Most of the genes you don't switch on until you see a danger signal, whether it's a chemical inducer or virus. And from here to here, you can go all the way to six, even seven logs, right? The difference is huge. Here, the mock, you have some genes already switch on. And when you have a danger signal, it goes up, but not by much. So this is the range difference. And that's, you know, in the previous animation. I don't have the time, obviously. These are all published, you know, so I just will give you examples of uh, elevated inner defense. I already said DNA damage. You know, some bats have a high level interferon alpha and high basic level for H of proteins and uh, uh, like the ABC transporters. This is a, a surface IFRAS pump. And uh, in cancer patients, we get induced, but for bats, it's always on. More importantly is we found that on the other hand, we have the dampen, you know, uh, everything, you know, the M2 media inflammation signal is completely missing. And uh, the inflammation activation is dampened and steam molecules, you know, the stimulated interferon genes is act, uh, Dampen, and then graft versus the host disease in your bat mouse, you know, so the immunodeficient mice, if you transplant the immune system like the humanized mice, which is equivalent to the human mice, you know, the human immune system will attack the, the mouse and eventually give the uh, graft versus the host disease. Whereas we did that with a bat immune system into mouse and the mouse was tolerated. Okay, so these are just some examples. So what I'm gonna focus is really inflammation. To me right now, the most exciting area is inflammation. There's a strong evolution pressure for bats to have a dampening inflammation. And uh, inflammation is a double-edged sword. We know that we need inflammation. It's part of the protection, right, defense. But if you have overboard and it becomes pathogenic. I mean, you know, I challenge you to go to, you know, science, nature, immunity, and the cells every week. You can find, if you could not find the one paper on inflammation, then you can come to me almost every week, every month there will be a high impact paper to do with inflammation in some kind of disease research or biomedical research. So I just gave you, you know, for fun, I, I, I thought about a list from A to Z, right? Aging, inflammation is involved. 
Zika virus inflammation is involved. In between, you have autoimmune disease, diabetes, you know, metabolic disease, and you name it. Okay, so because it's such an important, really, arm of defense in our body, it's a highly, highly conserved in all mammals. And it's highly, highly regulated because you need two signals to really activate inflammation. The first signal is called a priming, and the second is an activation signal. And in a second sort of a compartment, you have multiple redundant pathways, at least one, two, three, four, five, okay? But what they do is uh, no matter which is the ligand, which signal you're sensing, it's like a funnel. Eventually they come down to caspase one. And the caspase one from pro to activation by cleavage, and then they further cleave the I1 beta and, uh, and I18, and that triggers downstream inflammation. Okay. Now, just to summarize this, to say the last eight years of research, just in my group alone, we discovered six different mechanisms that bats have, we don't have, human mouse don't have, is for them to dampen and to regulate that. So they have a way to dampen the priming signal one, and then in the signaling two, they have ways to either delete the sensor or dampen the sensor or have negative regulators to inhibit the next ASCO molecule or to make sure that caspase one is not active or not as active. And also you can modulate the I1 beta. So six different levels and many, many different mechanisms. And that's just from our one group. You know, Imagine if you dig deep, you will find many more. So, this is, uh, you know, most of them are published, and this was published last year, so I'm going to just go quickly to say that we found that the NIP3 media inflammation in bats is dampened, and what that means for bats as a viral reservoir. So very quickly, it's published already, human and bat, bat is in red. As you can see, that LPS is the priming signal, so as you can see, there's a difference already. But when you LP is plus ATP, so ATP or nidrosine is the activation signal. Now you see the difference, more than tenfold difference. So the pathway is there, but it's dampened. Okay, that's what we went to see what's the mechanism. And uh, so this is the NIP3 gene, which is a very large protein of a thousand uh, amino acids, and they, it's a multi sort of exon, and it has you know different domains. And so we found that exon seven is the one that can be deleted. So bats have two different variants that every exon is involved or exon seven. So we have an exon positive or exon negative variants. The black is exon ne uh, 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 negative without exon seven. As you can see in liver, it's like 90%. In lung, it's like the 70%. And in spleen, it's like 60%. So it's the major form and then they also have an alternative ATG start codon. So you will have two initiation and two versions of exon seven. There's four possibilities. And so we construct all these four variants. And as you can see, compared with the human NRP3, in terms of uh, inflammatory activation, all of the variants are less active than the human. And then the exon seven is even you know, less active with the ATG start codon does not play a role. And we try to do chimeric sort of a, a, a recombinant proteins. All human is white, or bat is red, and we change one domain at a time from N terminal to the C terminal. As you can see here, the activity, this is the domain. Once the human NIP3 containing this from bats, the activity is reduced, okay? And uh, so the ARR domain is responsible for dampening in bats. Implication in tolerance of viral infection, so what we did is that we use the PBMCs from bat and from human. And uh, so when you press P uh, LPS, you know, nothing happens because that, but if you stand LPS plus the most coronavirus, so this now is a priming and the most coronavirus is the activation signal. If you look at the bat here and the human here, in terms of uh, uh, virus replication, you know, they're on the same scale basically. But in terms of inflammatory activation measured by this uh, uh, confocal, ask formation so the ask form a spec and then you get this uh, really intense red dot if you see this dot is activated if you don't see it it's not activated as you can see most can infect both human and uh, 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 bat immune cells
but the difference is that you have a huge inflammation activation with the back don't have. And we believe, you know, that explains why backs can tolerate infection with our disease, because as I said, overinflammation is the pathology usually for most SARS and COVID-19. Just a few weeks ago, we published this paper in PNS. So now we're going down to the next level, below the uh, uh, sensor and ask one, we go to the cast base and R1 beta. So this was done by Geraldine, it's an MD PhD student. So when she joined the lab, you know, we said, we already know that, you know, bats don't have the M2. So the, in this, this is the M2 mediated inflammasome pathways. So we said, what happens if we put a human M2 into it, can we restore the activity? So that's what she did. She had added a human M2 and then the spec formation now is restored. So if you add a human M2, that's as formation can happen. But when we went to downstream, try to detect the R1 beta, we still could not find the R1 beta secretion. So what happened, because we still have two steps, right? For R1 beta to be active, we need to ask, has to cleave the caspase one, and the caspase has to be active, and then cleave on R1 beta. So there's two possibilities that as the caspase one cleavage was uh, 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 not happening, or the R1 beta. So what we did, is we discovered is caspase one in these bats from Australia, the crops elected the large flying fox that we have the genome data. With the, for this particular bat, R1 beta cleavage is happening. So after this, we tried to see whether this is true for all bats. So this is the large flying fox in Australia. This is your next in Singapore, and this is Maltese in China. And as you, we go through the data that we found that, you know, this is the human caspase one, this is the Australian bat, Singapore bat, and the Chinese bat, and three different bats. As you can see, the human, the cleavage, this is a major caspase one activity, and we look at a mature R1 beta. So caspase ones are fully active in human. Very good, I have to say, in my orders, but almost no activity in the Australian uh, flying fox and intermediate in the Singapore bats. So that gets us really interested to think of that why they have different caspase activities. And then we even went further to look at R1 beta. So this is the myotis R1 beta. Remember, that's the one that the caspase was fully active. And that's the one from Australia, the caspase one was inactivated. And now we found a compensate. So here, the R1 beta can be cleaved. Is this the Y type? And this one now cannot be cleaved. And if you mutagenize, if you switch this Q residues between the two bat R1 beta, you can also switch the phenotype. So we know exactly which residue are important for cleavage. The important thing is this one. This is amazing. When I saw this, I could not believe it. So this is really evolution. There's a wonder job, you know, wonderful job. For humans, we have four caspase activity and we have four I1 beta cleavage. So human is here. For the Australian bats, the caspase activity is gone, as I show you, but R1 beta cleavage is okay. For the Chinese mountain bats, the caspase 1 activity is fully active, but R1 beta cleavage is a really low activity, and the, the, the Singapore bats is in between. So 65 million years of uh, adaptive evolution, different bats have evolved different pathways, and the results is same, whether it's you know, inactive, active, inactive, active, or both are partially inactivated. What you have is a dampened inflammation downstream R1 beta, whereas a human, you know, you can go over. Okay, so in summary, what we have is a better immune defense tolerance back in bats leads to a slow aging process, less prone to cancer, carrying virus without disease, less inflammatory disease, less autoimmune disease, less metabolic disease, and less every disease almost, you know, because they can balance this defense and tolerance. Okay, so the last part I'll just quickly go through is that, you know, we are still, I think, uh, have no idea when we can go back to normal pre sort of uh, COVID-19, maybe never. So in the last 20 years, you know, I personally have been involved from Hanjo, Nipple, SARS, MERS, you know, Ebola and the COVID-19. But I think this is the first time that we need an exit strategy, right? In the, all the previous outbreaks, basically containment was enough to go. We don't need a vaccine. We don't need to worry about all the tests to follow. So 
in terms of uh, challenges for COVID-19 serology, I list uh, uh, many of these. You know, the first five is really human applications, right? The last one is for the reservoir, which is animal application. So what we need for the first five is that we need a neutralizing antibody. The current ELISA test only measure binding antibody, which is not good enough, like the longevity or protect immunity, right? We know neutralizing antibody is essential. Whether it's sufficient, we don't know, right? And the convalescent plasma therapy and the vaccine efficacy. But the search for the natural reservoir, as we don't know which animal we target, we may have to search many, many different animals, like we did in Australia. We searched 42 animals. Eventually, we found the bats as the reservoir of the tangent virus. So what you need is serology, which is species independent serology. So I was in Wuhan in January. I already saw this. And by February, I was convinced we need an exit strategy. So I really mobilized the resources to go to serology. We developed six different platforms of serology. The most advanced is this surrogate virus centralization. And we have a pattern on this. So SVNT just addressed both of these key challenges. One is measuring neutralizing antibody. The other is in a species independent manner. So this was published in Nature About Tech. And I think for you guys in the audience, most of you will not be surprised. Now you know lots about coronavirus. And uh, you know, this is the sort of uh, computer graphic image. That's the sex, uh, sort of a, a diagram showing the spike protein here. This is the, the protein coding regions of the uh, uh, coronavirus. And uh, if you're infected by uh, any coronavirus, there'll be hundreds, if not thousands of antibodies antibodies bind to different parts of the uh, uh, protein. But majority of them are what we call binding antibodies, and then only one to three are functional neutralizing antibodies. And luckily for SARS-CoV-2, because we have done SARS-CoV-1, the homework, the basic research, we know exactly where the neutralizing antibody is. It's on this spike protein, and that's the green. And it's in a narrow, very domain called the receptor binding domain, which interacts with the human ACE2. The gold standard for virus neutralization is a, a live virus base, right? So you have a live virus comes in, bind to the receptor and internalize. If you have neutralizing antibody, you block this. Gold stand for what? Gold stand for specificity. Virus neutralization using live virus is not the most sensitive and certainly it's not the easiest, right? You require BSS3, you require very tedious in a three, slow and expensive and you need a highly skilled stuff and you need to dress like that before you do the assay. And the red out is this, you know, for untrained eyes, you cannot tell which one is positive, which one is negative. So what we did, our invention was very simple in principle, but that's a lot of science behind it. It's a biochemical simulation of frost neutralization. You know, so the diagram, this is a live virus, right? Now in a diagram, the virus interact with the receptor. In this case, is spike and IBD and it binds to the AC2 and if in the presence of neutralizing antibodies, and then you block that. What we did is, you know, engineer the protein, make it soluble. So the soluble AC2, we express that and we just coat on a simple ELISA plate. For the RBD, we engineer just the RBD domain, purify this and conjugate with the host registry pocket pox that is most commonly used enzyme for ELISA. So now we have a two component assay. This HRP RBD conjugate protein will bind to the RBD on the ELISA plate. And that if that bind happens, when you put in the substrate and H2O2, you have a signal. In the presence of neutralizing antibodies, it binds RBD and block that interaction and you eliminate or reduce the color. As simple as that. So it's very, very simple and it's a one hour assay and you can automate. So, you know, this is all in the Nature Biotech paper. The correlation between the surrogate virus neutralization and the conventional virus neutralization, as you can see, the R square is 0 0.86. Very, very good. And the only mismatch is in the lower end. You know, some uh, uh, serums that from SARS patient that is not showing neutralizing in the conventional uh, live virus neutralization, but showing some activity in the uh, uh, surrogate neutralization because it's more sensitive. It's a biochemical interaction. And in terms of specificity sensitivity, so we had a co two cohorts, in, one in Singapore, one in China. And as you can see, the specificity is 100%. The sensitivity is around 98, okay? And 
as I say, it has to be species independent, right? Performance. So this is, uh, you know, rabbit zero and the mouse zero, you know, naive, of course, no inhibition, and then immunize or challenge, you know, that, that you have this uh, very dose dependent inhibition. And so in addition to human, this SBNT now have been tried in 13 different animals by our collaborators and by ourselves. Okay, so this is a COVID-19 speed, you know. So March 10th, I discussed the invention with our commercial department. 20th, we had the proof of concept. 25th, we filed a patent. 26th, we talked to the commercial department, Gene Script. 23, April, less than a month, license agreement signed. And then we got the FDA equivalent approval in Singapore on May 8th, and we launched the commercial kit. And November 6th, we got the FDA approval. You know, this is the really very, very satisfying. And look at that. You know, this is a, a press release from FDA authorized the first test that detects neutralizing antibody from recent or prior SARS CoV 2 infection. The reason is that all the virus, live virus based assay, all pseudo virus based assay, because you use live virus in the live cell, you can never really quality uh, assur assurance. Uh, control and FDA has never approved a neutralization test based on live virus. So it remains the first and the only one. And the date, I mean, the timing is good, right? November 6, we got this approved. November 7, very important in USA the election. November 9, Pfizer uh, announced this 90% effective. So what we can do is really now, you know, address two important questions the vaccine and the protect immunity and the virus origin. So People always say, can antibody testing predict to protect immunity? And the first, of course, you know, people always argue, you know, binding antibody is not equal to neutralizing antibodies. Hence, you know, all the commercial kits. There are over 200 commercial kits on the market which measures binding antibodies. So not a direct measurement neutralizing antibody. So now we have a neutralizing antibody kit. So people argue, is the neutralizing antibody equivalent to protect immunity? We say most likely. And not only me, of course, you know, Tony Fauci agrees, you know, it should be a reasonable assumption that neutralizing would be a good correlate of immunity. And we have papers, and this is a very interesting paper uh, done by a group in uh, the University of Washington in Seattle, you know, so this is a very interesting study that followed a fishing uh, a vessel, went out to the ocean to do fishing, 144, 122 individuals, they sampled the blood and did a PCR. Of course, they were all PCR negative. Otherwise, you know, nobody is allowed to, if you have an active infection, you are not allowed to mix with your other crew members. And then, you know, uh, about, you know, 32 days later, one month later, they checked their sort of uh, immune status and also infection. So this is the antibody data. So the, before they depart, they did the ABA test, which is IgG, nuclear caps protein binding antibody, six of them are positive. They did the neutralization using the AC2 binding, which is our SVNT, only three positive because the cutoff is 20% inhibition. So one, two, three is negative. Remember six positive by this assay, only three by this. And when they come back by PCR, I have to say that it's very important because the attack rate was 85%. So among the 122 people, 85%, percent of them come back already PCR positive or infected, okay? And as you can see that the six, which was a positive here, only three were infected and the three were not. The three not infected or had a neutralizing antibody by SBNT. Okay, so, you know, last week, again, you know, Nature have this finally published. So this is uh, in rhesus monkey, did a passive really uh, 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 immunization so they immunized the monkey and used convalescent serum and then they transferred this to monkeys and did the challenger studies. And they found that in a dose dependent manner that the monkeys received the neutralizing antibody is protected. And furthermore, that relatively low antibody types are sufficient for protection against SARS-CoV-2. So we all hope that that happens in human. So the last question we ask is vaccination, does it equal to protection or prevention of infection and transmission? You know, so Qantas in Australia is trying to convince the government to say we will not accept the international passages unless they show a piece of uh, a vaccine certificate. And then I say, you know, even that may be not enough, right? We know already that uh, 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 Moderna and Pfizer 
and uh, vaccines are 90% effective, but it's a 90% against disease. We don't know what's the percentage against infection. And so it's not gonna be hundred percent. So uh, the last, I think, uh, you know, my time is running out. I'll go very quickly is on the spear over versus spear back. So spear over is forward is not transmission and spear back is reverse not transmission. And the mink story now in US, so we know that, but of course, cats, dogs, nuggets can also be susceptible. We used to think of the reservoir or the, the uh, wildlife can be a natural reservoir, intermediate host or amplifier host. But COVID-19 told us lesson can be a spill back host and what I call them can be a new unnatural natural reservoir, means that it's accepted by humans. So this is my current hypothesis. We believe it's a bat, maybe somewhere in Asia, could be in China, could be outside China. It the, carries the ancestor virus, the progenitor virus. I think it's still passed to animal X, adapted, and then in Wuhan, explosive human transmission, get to the world. Netherlands first, go to mink, mink to human. Okay, so that's bad enough, but at least mink is a farmed animal. What happens if it goes to really a wildlife like bats in America? And that will, you know, from time to time, they go to animal X, Y, Z, and the spill over again, and then you have SARS-CoV-3, 4, 5, 6, and then you have another human outbreak. So this is, a, 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 you know, a report in The Economist, and they quoted very, uh, two very important person, Peter Daszak from EcoHealth and uh, Darren Fry from Wellcome Trust. Both argue that the hunt for the origin of SARS-CoV-2 will look beyond China. The reason is that the back distribution, you know, this is Southern China, this is Southeast Asia. The dark, the color, you have greater species diversity. And definitely, if you go to Myanmar, Vietnam, and Laos, you have more of these bats. But the surveillance is uh, no way near as intensive in China. So we think we need to do that. And this is a science uh, report about my career and basically says, you know, I have developed a test and I'm going to do that to uh, really screen animals and in Southeast Asia. And I can review, we have some data and the uh, publication hopefully will be coming out soon. So where did COVID-19 come from? WHO is going to have a mission. I think the next January, they're going to go to China, but very importantly, the mission now have phase one and phase two. Phase one is in China. Phase two will go beyond China. Uh, so this is a, you know, a, a report of what I have say. And uh, I already got WHO funding to do serology in Southeast Asia, China, that I'm the PI. And then uh, Equal House also got one, I'm a co-PI to do this uh, with the, the wildlife animals around the world. And I try to declare, I have to declare my uh, conflict interest because I'm a, a, a patent application mm -hmm. co-inventor of this uh, uh, SVNT now is market under the trade name of CPAS by James Brick. This is my team and these are the heroes of my science, science. And thank you for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Linfa. That was really a great presentation, very comprehensive and uh, very much illustrating the uh, mm -hmm. the value, I mean, uh, the concrete value beyond the goodwill and the good words of uh, what we call One Health, global mm -hmm. and One Health. So thank you so much. Obviously, because of the technical problems, we, we will yeah. have only a few questions, but that's OK. And uh, uh, if you agree, in fact, we may have your slides being uh, uh, being available for for the uh, for the audience. But we do have time for a few questions. So we, I see yeah. somebody. So please uh, ask your question. Hi, uh, this is uh, Dr. Chandran. Very nice yeah. talk. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, have you looked at the IFA-16 in the nucleus, the inflammasome activator for the double-stranded DNAs uh, in the BAT system? It is... Yeah, it, yeah, so this is a good question that, uh, you know, my MD-PhD student tried to look at that, but uh, what we suffer is we don't have good antibodies, okay? okay? So we had a go and we could not find a good antibody, so this is kind of... Uh, Put on the back banner because back burner because of COVID nineteen now <laughs> everything is COVID nineteen yeah but it's a good question yeah thank you I have another quick question uh, yeah even though I mean the virus is getting adapted to the bats with with the dampened immune system yeah. and interference system but still they have a powerful arsenal of proteins which uh, 
down regulate human interferon as well as the uh, inflammatory responses. So, so how yeah. you evolutionally, how you reconcile that? Reconcile the fact that this they have the function there, but not uh, expressed. But they, so they in the batch they don't have those need. There is no pressure for those providers that. Uh, even though they are adapted to the bats, but still at the humans, they can really downregulate all the interferon responses. So they do have powerful proteins. Is that yes. proteins have some other functions in the bats, maybe? That could be, yeah, yeah, could be. And uh, also that uh, bats' uh, 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 immune system is not completely abolished, obviously, right? So bats still yeah. have that. So that maybe the virus still need that to uh, uh, further down regulate the host uh, uh, immune system, but don't have to work as hard as in humans or other mammals. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Uh, I have a general question, uh, Linfa, yeah. which is an obvious one, but. Uh, Based on all your experience on the sequence analysis and the investigation, is it really feasible to think in the future of uh, pan coronavirus vaccines? Yeah, so so that's a good question. And uh, personally, I think uh, it's almost impossible because that you need to find uh, a vaccine that maybe go with mainly for T cells because. Uh, the, the neutralizing antibodies, you know, I did not have the time to show you the data. For example, COVID-19, more than 90%, maybe close to 95% of neutralizing antibody all target this RBD because of the interaction with the receptor binding domain, which makes sense. That's why our SVNT is so successful. But then you look at the RBD domain across even the known SARS-related coronavirus, there's a sufficient difference already. For example, uh, you know, the, in our uh, paper we published in the Nature Biotech, we used the uh, SARS survivors from Singapore, so who got SARS infection 17 years ago. And interestingly, they still have this uh, 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 decent levels of neutralizing antibody against SARS-1, but they don't cross neutralize SARS-2. So okay. already give you, even SARS-1 and SARS-2 don't cross neutralize. So if you want to, like all the vaccines right now on the market, is spike protein based, and even the the Chinese vaccines, the whole inactive virus, they still measure the the, the anti S or the neutralizing antibody, which is based on RBD, right? So, using the current vaccine uh, technology approach, I think it will never work. You know, so it has to be maybe a purely uh, T cell based vaccine, which I don't know if it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well. We will stop there, but uh, yeah. thank you so much, Linfa. That was really a great lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize again for the technical hiccup. No, no, that you know, was not yeah, your yeah, responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Have a great okay. evening. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye.